Hey everyone, this is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton, joined by my co-host Max Blumenthal, and today we're going to talk about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And when I say Ukraine, of course, I also mean NATO, the European Union, and the United States. We've seen that the Joe Biden administration has continued a very hawkish line against Russia and has been really aggressively pushing in Ukraine. And it looks like the war might be heating up once again. And to talk about that conflict and the heating up of the war, we are joined today by Russell Texas Bentley. Russell Bentley is an American who in 2014 moved to Donetsk, the Donetsk People's Republic in eastern Ukraine. And he has been on literally on the front lines of the conflict, the proxy war going on there. Russell has a YouTube channel in which he has posted videos of what life is like there in the Donbass region. For those who are just listening and not watching, here we are playing some of his video clips. Hey, my name is Russell Bentley. My soldier name is Tejas. We're starting a new program with the Sud Vermini Information Unit. It's going to be called Donbass with Tejas. This position we're at today, our first program, little town of Spartak, near the airport, just north and east of Donetsk City. This is one of my old positions, called the Blizna, means fish hook. It's a hot position. It sticks out uh, into the Ukrop lines, surrounded on three sides. To the north, two kilometers, major Ukrop army base, Polish army, probably sector Nazis, U.S. and EU mercenaries. We've heard them on the you crop army frequencies, so we know they're there. This is a very hot position. A lot of guys been hit here. And we've done some hitting back too. And we're gonna keep doing it. So Russell, um, or Texas, as he's earned the, the nom de guerre on the front lines. Russell, can you just explain, you know, where are you? Where do you live right now? And what's the situation that's going on? Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you guys for uh, having me on. You guys have an excellent program, and I'm uh, real happy and proud thank to you. be uh, with you guys today. Uh, I came to Donetsk in December of 2014. Um, I immediately joined the uh, Vostok Battalion, um, and on December 31st, 2014, I was on the front lines at the Donetsk airport. Uh, in a, a very heavy combat position that happened to be a, a convent that was about 400 meters from the new terminal of the uh, Donetsk airport. Uh, I served uh, as a soldier, a uh, combat soldier, for about eight months in Vostok Battalion and then in uh, Han Spetsnaz Battalion. And then, you know, when I came here, I was 54. Once I joined that Spetsnaz Battalion, I started realizing I might be a little bit too old for ninja acrobatics. And so uh, I suggested that I might be more useful as a uh, information warrior, a uh, war correspondent and uh, anti-propagandist. So I started doing that uh, in 2015. I started with the uh, Don Bass Humanitarian Aid, a human aid fund that uh, I started with my godmother who's a native of Donetsk, but now lives in the States. And uh, since then, in 2017, I worked for four months on the Avdiivka front as a uh, basically a military policeman, but my real job was soldier, frontline soldier. But uh, other than that, so I spent about a year on the front. And uh, other than that, I've been doing humanitarian aid and uh, trying to do as much uh, counter propaganda and uh, you know, reporting on the truth of what's happening here ever since. I'm a citizen of the DPR, soon to get my Russian passport, and I'm married here. I have a home, and I'm planning on living here the rest of my life because I really love it here. Before we get into uh, what's been happening in recent weeks, which has led to this escalation uh, where the the so-called steady state in that's now in the White House has gotten things so unsteady on the uh, frontiers of Russia and deliberately. So um, I wanted to just ask you about how you see the conflict there 
because watching your videos, you frame the conflict in terms of anti-fascism and almost a sort of continuation of World War II. I mean, some of the fighters that you've been in the trenches with there in Donetsk, Donetsk have said the same, that this is, you know, they their families lived through World War II and they're they're living through similar situations. So maybe you can kind of articulate the conflict as you see it for our viewers. <clears throat> well, when I say that it's a conflict against fascism, uh, first of all, in Ukraine during the Second World War under German occupation, there was a uh, significant segment of Ukrainians that became Nazi collaborators under this dude named Stefan Bandera. And I mean, Bandera wore a SS uniform. Uh, he was uh, uh, responsible for some of the most, you know, horrendous atrocities, including Bobby R. Uh, here in Donetsk, um, there's a, a mine that had a 360 meter vertical shaft. And in 700 days of occupation, the German Nazis, with the help of the Banderisti collaborators, uh, threw 75,000 people down that shaft. So, I mean, you can understand, you know, the, uh, the scope of the brutality, I mean, the absolute genocide. And, yep, that's Bandera right there. And, uh, you know, so when the Russian Red Army came through here, cleaned out Ukraine, liberated Ukraine, a lot of these Banderistis ran uh, back west to Berlin, and very many of them ended up in the United States and particularly in Canada. And uh, they're there now. Uh, Christia Freeland, who is the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, is the granddaughter of a Nazi collaborator, a Ukrainian Nazi collaborator. And she's uh, certainly doing her best to uh, continue on with, uh, you know, where he was coming from back then. So yeah, she, she actually said she was proud of her grandfather, and she claimed that the when this was exposed actually by communists in in Canada, she said that it was all Russian disinformation. It was a Russian propaganda plot, even though it's objective. Like it, it's an undeniable fact that that Christia Freeland's grandfather not only was a Ukrainian Nazi collaborator, but he ran a, a pro Nazi propaganda newspaper that was taken over that had previously been. Uh, it was a printing press that was owned by Jews, and they, they took the printing press, sent the Jews to extermination camp, and made it a Nazi newspaper. Mm -hmm. And when when we talk about fighting against fascists here, too, it's important to understand that we're not just talking about Ukrainian fascists, because what the United States has become is basically the Fourth Reich. You know, when you consider that, uh, you know, Mussolini supposedly said that Fascism should be considered, could be called corporatism because it is the merger of state and corporate power. Now, there's some dispute about whether he said it or not, but there's absolutely no question that that is exactly the perfect definition of fascism. There's another thing you can find on the, uh, on the Internet. It's called the 14 Characteristics of Fascism, and both uh, Ukraine and the United States you know, uh, and coming along quite quickly, Canada and England too, and a lot of the EU, you know, they they fit almost every one of them, you know. So the important thing to understand is that Ukraine is a colony of the United States. Nothing happens in Ukraine without the permission and direction of the people that control the U.S. government now. And the important thing to remember about that is – I mean, you know, we understand that when Maidan happened and the uh, famous Victoria Newland intercepted phone call, you know, everybody said, oh, it's, you know, she said F the EU, you know, and so that was like the big scandal. But that missed the whole point that what she was talking to Pyatt about, who was the U.S. ambassador, was deciding exactly who for exactly what office of the Ukrainian government and all the people that she said in that phone call ended up in exactly the positions that she directed them to be in. So, you know, uh, Newland worked for Clinton, Clinton's secretary of state. She worked for Biden, Biden, Obama called him and uh, 
And Biden called himself the point man in Ukraine from 2014 until the end of the Obama administration. And so here's the important thing to understand about that. It was Biden who directed the rebels of Maidan to get those Georgian snipers to shoot the, the protesters and the cops. A hundred people were murdered by snipers in Maidan in Kiev. Nobody really knows, you know, the, the Ukrainian courts have never placed the blame on anybody. Uh, although they say it was the Barracuda, which is, of course, a lie. But there are Georgian snipers, mercenaries, who came forward and said that they were paid. They named names. They said exactly where they were, who gave the orders, and the orders were to shoot protesters and cops just to escalate the level of violence. That could not, and that was on the uh, Hotel Ukraine, which was at that time, whole floors of it were being like rented out and controlled and occupied by CIA and U.S. Secret Services. So the U.S. has been responsible for everything that happened. Biden personally was the leader of the U.S. policy in Ukraine when the Maidan snipers murdered 100 people, when in May 2nd of 2014, the Odessa massacre, where they brought in a bunch of uh, neo-Nazis that burned alive an unknown number of people, but certainly scores of people that were burned alive, beaten to death, and murdered in Odessa for peacefully protesting against this coup. And then again, you understand that also in 2014 was MH17 shot down, the Dutch airline, or the Malaysian airline with all the Dutch people on it. It's now being a kangaroo court in uh, in The Hague in uh, Amsterdam. But this is all Biden's work, you know. And, I mean, he was a very evil, dangerous dude back then. I mean, obviously now, you know, he can't even find his own ass with both hands. He's completely senile. But the people that control him, controlled him back then, and are now again in power. So, I mean, Biden is the guy who instructed him. He was here two days before they started the official ATO, anti-terrorist operation, when the Ukrainian army moved against the people of Donbass. And in the first days of that operation, civilians were literally standing in front of tanks and BMPs, you know, holding their hands like the dude in Tiananmen Square, and they were getting run over and shot. And so they said, okay, you know, if we can't compel, com, uh, you know, uh, ask, you know, to uh, for reason, if we can't ask for compassion, then we'll fight, you know, and really, you know, they say, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's just rhetoric to call them Nazis and stuff. No, it's not. Nazi is as Nazi does. And these guys are just as vicious, just as brutal. You know, they, they there's a video from Marinka, which is about three miles from where I'm at right now. And when Zelensky was on the front there recently, they were flying the Wormacht flag, you know, the red flag with the swastika in the middle they yeah, were I flying tweeted, i tweeted video of that and we'll we'll throw it in and in, in post that was the that was the position that Zelensky had visited and it was the flag of the german nazi army flying i guess they were they were taunting the positions of the donbass brigades the the what, what we would refer to in the u.s as pro-russian separatists um so have you i mean have you come into contact with uh, the Ukrainian army? Have you seen combat against them? And um, have you, you know, exchanged any hostile communications with them at any point? Dude, I have, dude. And I'm talking more. Uh, my hostile communications were in the form of uh, hot lead and RPG rockets. I mean, my first uh, eight months here was basically all on frontline combat positions. I'm talking Donetsk Airport, uh, Spartak, Avdiivka, and I mean back back when it was you know the heavy shooting war. You know I've been you know under every kind of bombs and bullets that there is, and I've done some uh, payback too. You know, um, you know, and I mean the thing is there's there's been several Americans that came to Ukraine to join the Ukrainian side. Um, one of them is Craig Lang. He's still here. He, uh, 
joined the Pravi sector. He actually was uh, uh, on the opposing side when I was in Spartak back in 2015. Um, then he went back to the States for a while. Uh, he, Him and this buddy of his named Zwiefelhofer, uh, they went ahead and murdered a couple of uh, an elderly couple in Florida um, and in order to get money to go first to fight against uh, Venezuela and then they went somewhere in Africa like to, to be mercenaries there, ended up screwing up and coming back. Lang got a fake passport or a, a real American passport in somebody else's name, made it back to Ukraine. Uh, Zwiefelhofer got busted when he came back from Africa, child porno on his uh, telephone, uh, which he ended up being one of the stars of. So he's now uh, awaiting uh, two first-degree murder charges in Florida. Craig Lang's been here since then, um, and the Ukrainians have really been dragging their feet. You know, as much as or as little as the United States has requested his extradition, you know, it's been more than a year, and he's still sitting in Kiev. So, I mean, you know, the dudes that came to fight for Ukraine, uh, you know, they were real, you know, bloodthirsty psychopaths, uh, losers, you know. And, you know, I mean, there's, you know, you know, there's good and bad people on both sides in any war. But one way that you can really tell who's the good guys and who's the bad guys is if there's a bunch of guys on one side that say, Heil Hitler and have swastika tattoos and fly Nazi flags, and on the other side they don't, you know, then you can get a pretty good example. You know, we fly the communist flag. I was in a communist uh, combat unit here called Essence of Time, and it was uh, a very hardcore frontline unit, you know, but we, you know, we're not, we're not attacking, we're only defending. I've never been in an offensive operation in my whole time uh, as a soldier. And, you know, really there haven't been. We've only been defending ourselves, defending our family. There's no strategic depth. You know, if, you know, the Ukraps come in, you know, it's it's five miles from the front line to the center of Donetsk City. Yeah, I just, I want to point out really quickly that what Russell mentioned here, I mean, this case, it should be much more well known in the United States, but it got very little press coverage. This is a report and the Associated Press from last year, S soldiers set up deadly robbery to fund foreign fighting. And it talks about here, the two former U.S. Army soldiers met in Ukraine where they joined the same far-right paramilitary group. I mean, that's, that's a euphemism for a Nazi group. After getting deported, they planned to take a boat from Miami to South America. They wanted to fight the socialist government and kill communists. So, I mean, these are the, the literal fascists who were going to join the Ukrainian side, and also, and, and they did go to Venezuela as well to assist in the Guarimbas, and you know they found common cause there with Leopoldo Lopez and his crew. Leopoldo Lopez, an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience, exactly. Who, when, when after attempting a violent military coup that totally fizzled out because there were like twenty five soldiers that joined, uh, he's later. Uh, whisked away to the Spanish embassy where he is he's now being protected by Spain. But when journalists went through his house afterward, they also found books by Hitler, including uh, Mein Kampf. But by the way, speaking of, of these Nazi forces and, and Joe Biden, I just want to point out that, um, as our friend and colleague Alex Rubenstein pointed out, that when Joe Biden was, was the point man in Ukraine, he met he has, he had, there's a photo of him meeting with Ole Tanbyuk, who is a notorious neo-Nazi in Ukraine. And this is also pretty funny because he was Joe the Biden, one that Newland said should be kind of on the sidelines. Like, you know, when you give Yats the attaboy, she wanted Tianbok on the sidelines kind of. And there he is with McCain on stage at the Maidan. Chris Murphy uh, was next to him, I think, you know, ranking Democrat on the foreign affairs committee so exactly i mean my so partisan people, support for a sig heiling nazi so for people mm -hmm. listening there's a photo here of this <clears throat> ukrainian nazi and prominent politician oletan Byuk, and he's doing a, a hitler nazi salute and this is the guy who again appeared on stage with john mccain he's in a photo with joe biden and has also appeared with other democratic 
politicians, including well, Chris. And, and, and we've written about the phenomenon of foreign fighters on the Ukrainian side and specifically in the Azov Battalion and their national corps, which is sort of their ideological and civilian brigade that goes into Kiev to lay down the law. Um, specifically, I, I wrote about an indictment of several members of the Rise Above movement who were like an alt-right or white nationalist group in Orange County who'd been involved in violence against anti-fascists and immigrants down there. And they went to train with uh, the National Corps, the civilian brigade of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion that's incorporated into the National Guard. They, you know, they did MMA style fighting. Azov has a gym in Kiev where they do that. And there's this woman who's like the chief ideologue of the National Corps named uh, Olena Semenyaka, uh, who's really into uh, Julius Evola and the romanticism of fascism. She dresses like a goth. She writes uh, papers about, you know, academic style papers about death metal and hosts a fascist death metal convention each year in Ukraine and fascists from around Europe visit. And the hilarious, or actually not hilarious, but sort of absurd and upsetting aspect of Semenyaka's story is that she was given a fellowship in Vienna under the watch of Timothy Snyder. Uh, he, they, they, they like had a panel give her an, a, a fellowship after all of this. And Timothy Snyder was sort of, uh, you know, mildly embarrassed, but, you know, got no negative press in the U S this is like the premier academic that everyone turned to in the Trump era on fascism. Who's at Yale and who is, you know, yeah, I also want to point out that Timothy Snyder, his whole <laughs> ac academic career has been dedicated to pushing what's known as the double genocide thesis, which is the new latest form of Holocaust revisionism, which has become mainstream. In fact, legally mandated in many parts of Eastern Europe, these these NATO and EU member states in like the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, that officially have their state doctrine is that that Nazism and Soviet communism were both equal genocidal forces and that you have to, and, and you can't say anything positive about the Soviet Union or its genocide su support for genocide. And they're actually imprisoning people. They ban communist parties. And Timothy Snyder has been this Yale liberal who loves the Democratic Party, who's deeply embedded in Democratic capital D politics. He has he has provided the intellectual artifice, the the stanchion, which is totally absurd with his book Bloodlands. Um, just trying to, I mean, he's basically the liberal face of Holocaust revisionism. Yeah. And, uh, well, and we can talk about how the conflict around the Donbass has been framed, but I think before we get into the larger background, Russell, I want to ask you about just what you've seen in the past weeks, uh, including the defender Europe exercises that the U S military has been carrying out because the, the framing, that we've received in the U.S. Um, as usual, it's like you know that the Pentagon or the CIA taps their baton and then the orchestra all plays the same note. Is that Russia was going to invade Ukraine and that the Russian military escalated in order to test the West's response? But what were you seeing there? Because what I was hearing there from correspondents on your side was that. Ukrainian military had been escalating well ahead of the Russian military sending its heavy armor to the front. Indeed, uh, the Ukrainian military, since Biden assumed the White House again, uh, has been escalating intensely and more and more on a daily basis. There are, uh, on along the 200 mile front of the um, Donbass republics, Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics, there are 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers right now. Heavy artillery, tanks, Tochka U, ballistic missiles, uh, Grad multi rocket launchers, heavy artillery, the whole nine yards. And not only was there a lot there before, but since Biden, they've just been, I mean, train loads, multi-train loads a day. And they were going to attack on the 15th of March. Uh, the word came down from the United States. We're going in on the 15th of March. 
the Ukrainian army understands that it would be a suicide mission because if the Ukrainian army attacks Donbass, the Russians will come in. And that is why, you know, that's basically why they put 150 of their soldiers on the Russian side of the border, but not just in Donbass, all the way up to Kharkov and to Kiev, because they're not just going to come if the Ukrainians attack Donbass in another major military operation, uh, the Russians are going to go ahead and take care of this problem once and for all. If not all of Ukraine, at least as far as Kiev, and uh, they're going to go ahead and straighten it out. You understand that Ukraine is an absolutely failed state now. It is, uh, I mean, it, it's like Mexico, except the United States controls Mexico and uh, the cartels and bandits there, and the United States controls Ukraine and the cartels and bandits here. But I mean, the crimes that have been committed um, under this new uh, coup government in Ukraine against Ukrainian people, I mean, every metric of quality of life has like fallen off the cliff in the last seven years. Uh, the price of gas has gone up 400% in Ukraine. It's still the same price here in the Donbass republics that it was before the war. You know, and the, and the thing is, they even had a multi-million dollar debt to the gas company, the National Gas Company in Kiev, like two years ago in the wintertime. And the gas company just turned off the gas to, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people living in these uh, Soviet uh, era apartment blocks in the middle of winter, of Ukrainian Russian winter. And when you turn off the gas and there's no heat in the apartment, you have to turn off the water too because the water will freeze and bust the pipes. So, you know, there's like two styles of old Soviet uh, apartment buildings. There's the five story, which is a walk up. And then there's the nine or 14 or 15 story that have an elevator. But uh, think of all the old ladies, the grandmas, that living on the fifth floor in a freezing cold apartment that not only had no heat, but they had to carry all their water up and down those stairs, man. I mean, it, it was brutal. It was ruthless. You know, another thing that they did that doesn't get a lot of uh, coverage in the West is that when they made uh, Saakashvili, the governor, you know, the ex-president of uh, Georgia, who's a war criminal and wanted in his own country, he came to Ukraine in like 2015, and they made him the governor of the Odessa Oblast, which is like the state that surrounds the city of Odessa. He began... He took control of the Odessa port. He started importing nuclear and toxic waste and exporting little kids. And that's, you know, at least over here, that's pretty well do documented. You know, they've they've clear cut the, the forests of the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, they're doing fracking uh, on the occupied Ukrainian side uh, that's poisoning the water, not only in Donbass, but also across the border in Russia. You know, they've got, you know, they're doing GMO, GMO crops, you know, like no tomorrow in Ukraine. GMO crops are uh, outlawed in the Donetsk republics and in Russia. But if they're doing GMO in Ukraine, well, that pollen doesn't know the border and it's going across and contaminating uh, our crops in Donetsk and also uh, in Russia itself. You know, so, I mean, they're poisoning the water, they're poisoning the air, they're poisoning the food. You know, they're dumping, you know, toxic waste that will, you know, be uh, deadly for who knows how many years or centuries. And uh, I mean, and they're just ruining the lives of people. You know, the Ukrainian people, you know, they say that 25 percent of all the prostitutes in Europe are from Ukraine. You know, so yeah, these people, they're, they're yeah, gangsters. Ukraine has, or, Ukraine has had people. more out Ukraine has had more migration out migration than any other country in the world, except perhaps Venezuela, which has been under us siege since 
2015 and under U.S. attack since really the time that Hugo Chavez came to power. So, and that's never discussed. I mean, we constantly hear about Venezuelan migrants. We're talking about a substantial percentage of Ukrainians, the young, anyone who's capable of working, they've like largely left. Um, and I just want to point out, this yeah. is a recent article in Ukrainian media, and it, it's qu quoting the, the vice speaker of the parliament, the Rada in Ukraine, it's officially admitting that the poverty rate in Ukraine in 2020 increased to 50 percent of the population. This, this makes it one of the poorest countries in Europe. And I mean, this is never discussed, especially by all the anti-Russia hawks in the Democratic Party who constantly say that Putin is doing this and doing that. I mean, half of Ukrainians are living in poverty. Their own government's admitting it. It's crazy. This is the effect of uh, U.S. and NATO liberation. You know, I mean, look at what we did to Yugoslavia. Look at what we did to Afghanistan. Look at what we did to Iraq. Look at what we're doing to Syria. Look at what we're doing to Venezuela. You know, this is the right to protect you know, we'll come in, steal the oil, steal the kids, you know, and, and basically destroy the country. You know, after after Muammar Gaddafi was murdered and, um, and, you know, the most prosperous country in Africa was destroyed, you know, that's really, you know, I actually uh, climbed up on a 15-meter uh, high billboard in Austin, Texas, one night just before dawn and uh they had a big advertisement up there about for the u.s marine recruiting and i wrote fuck nato in six foot tall letters on it you know and that was just that was the least i felt that i could do and uh so you know and it just it killed me because i really admired muammar Gaddafi just because i knew who he really was and what he did and uh you know, and then when I start seeing it going again in Maidan, I just actually what happened, it was on June 2nd, 2014, there was an airstrike by the Ukrainian Air Force against the administration building in Lugansk. And this is a civilian, like, you know, government office. There weren't, you know, I mean, there was probably some soldiers around, but it wasn't a military base or anything like that. You know, SU-25 comes in shoots a bunch of rocket, kills a bunch of civilians that were standing outside in front. And there's a famous picture of a woman named Inna Kukuruza who was hit in that attack. And she wasn't killed immediately, but both of her legs were blown off. And she's sitting there in a pool of blood. And some guy comes up and he's like, you know, documenting it, taking a video with his camera or something. And there was a photo made from that video where she's sitting on the ground next to her legs and looking into this camera about one minute before she died. And dude, that, that picture just, uh, I mean, it, it looked into my soul, you know, it was like, she was asking me, what are you going to do about this? And that it was exactly June 2nd, 2014. That's when I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to Ukraine. There's, you know, or, or die trying. And I, you know, I planned to be there at the end of August. But it took me a little longer to get my visa and get everything arranged. But I got here on, on the uh, 7th of December. And uh, I've been here ever since. To fight against real Nazis. It's not rhetoric to call someone that murders civilians, that says Heil Hitler, that wants to commit genocide. Uh, it's not rhetoric to call them a Nazi. If they act like a Nazi and they say Heil Hitler, then what else can you call them? And I came here to fight them. And I did. And uh, I also came here to help the good people and the innocent people, innocent victims of this war. And I've done that. Our uh, humanitarian aid fund has brought over $100,000 in the last five years, you know, which ain't a great amount, but it's certainly a lot of help here. And we concentrate mainly on kids, schools, orphanages, and people that have been like personally negatively affected by the war, like you know, some grandmom whose house got hit by artillery shell or something. We help fix that up. And we have uh, our, our website, DonBassHumeAid.com. I'll send you the link or something. But, uh, you know, we've done a lot of good here. You know, it's, you know, you get, you get all these people, you know, these, 
you know, adventure seekers that join on the Ukrop side, join Azov and, you know, they want to march around or go kill, you know, whoever, the enemy, communists or whatever. You know, I didn't come here wanting to kill. I came here, dude, I didn't, I was 54. I hardly even spoke Russian. I didn't expect to live through the winter. I came here to stand with these people that were on the small side against a big, full-on national army and to, you know, to help defend them and to die with them if I had to. And that's the difference between their side and our side. We're defending our own homes. We didn't go to Kiev. You know, we, you know, they came here with planes and tanks and bombs and guns, and we're just defending them. Ourselves, our families, our homes. There's no, I mean, like I said, it's three miles to the front from here. You know, there's there's no place for us to run. You know, this dude, uh, Dmitry Orlov, I have to say something. He wrote an article the other day that's been getting a little bit of uh, chatter about. And he said, oh, you know, the, the greatest thing that Russia could do and bri brilliant move of Putin would be for just to relocate the four and a half million people of the Donetsk People's Republic to Russia. <clears throat> you know, and uh, I've, I've read Orlov for years. And, uh, you know, I'll just say that I, I used to have a lot of respect for him. But, you know, a suggestion like that, um, it, it's incredibly stupid. It's not I mean, it's it's so stupid that it can only be called uh, treacherous, you know, because we're not running. This land is already soaked in blood by the Nazis one human lifetime ago. You know, we're not going to surrender. We're not going to give up, especially because we can beat these Nazis again, just like we did if the Russians help us and they will help us. And that's what happened on the 15th of March. Uh, the generals, uh, they did an anonymous survey of the frontline Ukrainian troops. And uh, it was like, you know, put a white marble or a black marble, uh, white if you're going to follow the orders and attack, black if you're not, 75% came out black. So they had to tell their masters in Washington, hey, we can't attack right now because our guys, you know, they'll be shooting at us instead of at, at, at the people in Donbass. So what continues now? There's U.S. Special Forces, British SAS. Canadian Special Forces, Turkish Special Forces, ISIS, terrorist head choppers are being recruited from Syria and brought here. And they're, you know, they're basically uh, bulking up, you know, with some real hardcore bloodthirsty, you know, professional killers, you know, not to be on the front line against us, but to be like the pushing troops, you know, with the bayonets in the back of the front line Ukrainian troops that don't want to fight. Let me ask you, because you've uh, detailed pretty well the mentality and the ideology of the other side, the Ukrainian side. What is the prevailing ideology uh, of the forces on what would be described in the West as the pro-Russian side? Um, you, in one of your videos, pointed to a poster of Lenin and an orthodox christian cross and said that the what people are fighting for at least in your you know in your barracks is communism and christianity this is the old barracks room at the blizna position this is where the soldiers live when they're not on the firing line here's where they sleep here's where they eat. keep our weapons right here always ready and this is what we believe in Christianity and communism. It's not the least bit of a contradiction. The early Christians were communists. They lived a communist lifestyle. Nova Russia, communism 2.0. There's definitely room for religion here. I can tell you when you're shooting and getting shot at every day, you do your fair share of praying. I know I didn't mind right here. So we're gonna defend this country. We're gonna defend this position. We don't resent, surrender, we don't retreat, because we're the new kind of communist, 2.0. We got Lenin and we got God on our side. We cannot be defeated. Uh, this is our friend and comrade, Bola. 
For those who are just listening and not watching, in this video clip, Russell is interviewing a soldier that he's fighting beside, and it's in Russian, and the, the subtitles say, how long have you been in the Nova Russia army? And he says, since the beginning of spring. And then the soldier adds, Nazism is a destructive ideology. And the soldier says, it must be destroyed. I don't see any other options. I was born in this land. We, the people of Donbass, are internationalists. We couldn't be anything else. I didn't ever see a single skinhead in our city. They never appeared. To hate a nation only because it has different roots, this is alien to us, the soldier says. And I never, I actually never associated communism with these forces. I saw them more as patriotic, uh, nationalistic, maybe. Um, and, and, you know, fighting against being overrun by a force that despised them, that would have cleansed them from the area. What, 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 what were your political views when you came in there? And to what extent is communism or socialism a prevailing ideology where you are? Well, Donbass was... And, and, and sorry, uh, just, just real quickly, and like, how would you describe the morale on the front lines as well? Because you mentioned the morale of the Ukrainian forces being really low. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> first of all, like I said, as far as the morale, we're defending our homes and our families. There's no place to run. <clears throat> Everyone that gets captured will either be murdered or put down in a coal mine to be slaved to death. <clears throat> There's no retreat. There's no surrender. So we will fight to the death. Uh, as far as communism and Russian Orthodox religion, uh, when I came here, and I I am a communist, uh, I started reading Ho Chi Minh and Che Guevara back in the 70s. Uh, I mean, actually, while the, the Vietnam War was still going on. And uh, it really inspired me. I understood then uh, a lot, particularly Che Guevara was a huge uh, influence on me. I went to Cuba in 1995, spent about a month there, you know, saw the Cuban Revolution for what it really was, which was uh, most impressive and a beautiful thing and worth defending. And when I came here, um, I joined up with the Vostok Battalion, which was the original military formation uh, formed by uh, Commander Alexander Khodorkovsky, um, who used to be a uh, SBU, kind of like uh, special forces in the Ukrainian government, but then who came to the Donbass side immediately after the, the coup. And I told them that I was a communist. And they said, well, we have a, uh, a company in our battalion called Sud Vremeni, which means essence of time. Uh, that are communists. And so I joined up with them. Um, and Essence of Time is run by a guy named Sergei Kurganyan. They have an excellent website in English. Uh, it's called uh, Essence of Time International. And uh, basically they have like a plan and a blueprint for the Soviet Union 2.0. And I got to say that like the communist, communist Party in Russia and uh, the Communist Party, even here in the DPR, you know, they're kind of like, you know, the handful of communist parties in the United States, which is to kind of say a, you know, tragic joke. You know, you know, they're they're not really serious. They're more like <clears throat> mutual admiration societies or drinking clubs. They're not capable of accomplishing anything. Essence of time is a very powerful movement in Russia. They're not a political party, but they're capable of being any time that they decide to be. And uh, they have members all over the world. Uh, you know, anyone that's interested in the future of communism would do well to look into the essence of time. Um, and one of their things, they what they say is, we want the Soviet Union 2.0. We want to learn from the mistakes of the past, and we want to build on all of the good things that that the Soviet Union was able to accomplish. You know, I mean, people that <clears throat> are familiar with Dr. Michael Parenti and read his books, like, for example, uh, Black Shirts and Reds, right there, it is the perfect 
you know, in a hundred page book, you know, he sets out the whole thing, the accomplishments of the Soviet Union, the differences between, you know, communism and fascism. And I got to say that, you know, uh, these vermin that, you know, equate communism and fascism. I mean, that's like, you know, that's the most diabolical lie that there ever could be. You know, I mean, it's it's complete hypocrisy. It's completely unbased in facts. Uh, and it's just a dirty lie. Uh, you know, it was communism that saved the world from fascism. It was the, the Red Army, the Soviet Union. You know, they did, uh, you know, 80 percent of the destruction of the German Wehrmacht. Nazi army in the Second World War was accomplished by Russian soldiers, Red Army soldiers. So the Red Army, you know, they paid the bill. And then, you know, the allies, England, America, Canada, Australia, la di da you know, they covered the tip. You know, all, all those guys combined, you know, they covered the tip. You know, so, you know, anyone that, you know, this historical revisionism, it's truly really straight out of 1984, you know. It's a lot it's it's along with, you know, the censorship on the internet, historical revisionism. I mean, it's all part of a plan to erase history. And and there's people that are working on exactly that very seriously today. Well, this is a great segue, Russell, because you mentioned censorship of the internet and you've been targeted by that. I mean, just so blatantly you said that you had your Facebook account suspended. Your Twitter account has been suspended. Fortunately, you still have a YouTube channel, and and we'll post a link to your YouTube channel in the comments below, and people can check out your. By videos. the way, OJ Simpson is on Twitter, and nobody's tried to cancel him, and he, he's like going viral, <laughs> like LeBron James, you were not sensible. So yeah, you're you're banned. But OJ's good though, you know. Speaking of decapitated, and, and I want to so say anyway, that. Uh, go ahead. I'm not suspended, dude. I'm banned for life. My account is deleted on both Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, well, well, so can you just respond to that? I mean, why do you think that you were suspended? And did you ever get any kind of explanation? And what do you think about the censorship? Well, it's, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I was on Facebook for 12 years. Um, you know, so for five years before I even came to Donbass. And, um, you know, I had like the, the 5,000 friend limit plus a couple of thousand followers on top of that. Uh, I, I had I had uh, a fair amount of attention and influence on my Facebook page. And, uh, you know, the people, the powers that be started taking that seriously. I mean, you know, for the last couple of years, you know, I would get a 30 day ban and then get back. I mean. I don't know if you've ever seen the famous picture. Uh, it's like it says, be this guy. And it's uh, from the Second World War. And it's a black and white photo of, you know, all these Germans giving the Sig Heil. And then there's one dude with his arms crossed. And it says, be this guy. And I got suspended for posting that because it was, you know, uh, promoting dangerous organizations. You know, I mean, they just, you know, they just, they, they, they pull these excuses out of their ass in order to silence me. Yeah, there you go right there, man. <laughs> and I yeah, got well, suspended for posting that picture. That's so crazy. Well, I mean, well, he, I, his I arms are can... folded cuz he doesn't want to get vaccinated. Maybe that's what it is. So. <laughs> ah, that could be it. <laughs> well, he doesn't I, I want the AstraZeneca. Pretty, we can pretty confidently now say that a lot of this censorship is very clearly being driven by the US government and western governments. I mean, we already know it's on record that the Israeli government very frequently forces Facebook to delete posts from Palestinians, very innocuous things criticizing, you know, Israeli colonialism and the occupation. And, and we know that, you know, the Indian government recently has been, which is very closely allied with the U.S., has been forcing Facebook to delete content criticizing its horrible response or lack of response to COVID. So we also know that you know, the Atlantic Council, which is funded by the U.S. government, it's NATO's de facto think tank. The Atlantic Council works with Facebook on so-called fact checking and censorship. We know that Twitter hires someone as the editor for Middle East content who's an active he's, he's an active duty uh, soldier in a psyops unit, an information war, information warfare unit of the British military. So, 
you know, I think we can pretty confidently say that the U.S. government and other Western governments are pushing for censorship of what they call so-called Russian disinformation, which is anything that they don't like. But Russell, I mean, what do you think, <laughs> what is your response been as someone who's involved in counter propaganda work, as you say, trying to get the perspective of these people in in Donbass, who we never hear in, in the Western corporate media, never. If, if you li- read any Western corporate media outlet, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC or the New York Times or Washington Times, regardless of whether or not they call themselves conservative or liberal, all of them are uniformly on board saying that Russia is evil and that everyone in Eastern Ukraine is all, all of them in, from every man, woman and child is like, a Putin puppet who are just following orders from the Kremlin. So if you want to get that perspective out there of people who we never hear from, you know, what have you been doing and what have the tactics of, of others been to try to break that, that total, you know, blockade of information and the total censorship regime we've seen? Well, in uh, 2015, uh, this dude, uh, Simon Ostrovsky for Vice News, came and he interviewed me, you know, he was trying to, uh, you know, um, cut my legs out from under me, you know, do a hit piece. Uh, the hipster arm of empire. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, I really, I guess you could say it was uh, informational judo. I basically kicked his ass. You can still see uh, it's still on Vice News and uh, I made him look stupid, you know, and there's, you know, you can just look at the, I mean, I think it's got like half a million views, you know, and you can look at the vi- likes versus the dislikes and the comments. And of course, there's a lot of comments from idiots that watch Vice News in general. But, uh, you know, I was able to beat him at his own game, you know, which, you know, intellectually, you know, the what you say with the, the, a battle of wits with an unarmed man. <laughs> but uh, that is a pretty good uh, video. That is from the front line. And, uh, you, I mean, people can see right there. He so looks so smarmy. Thing. He just looks like, look, look at the contrast of you and him. He looks like just some smarmy guy who's, you know, sitting in a, sitting in an office in Williamsburg, Brooklyn with horn rimmed glasses. And then you're there with like a rifle slung across your waist and you're like slouching. He looks really nervous. Like his body language, he's like twiddling. He was terrified. Palm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that just kind of says it all right there. (laughs) And he's got his stupid little helmet on. All these press guys, they love wearing their helmets. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, and you got like a a straw hat. I mean, it's that that so that's great contrast. I uh, you know, was googling. I just googled your name just to see what came up. And like Ben was talking about all of the different algorithmic tricks and censorship mechanisms that have been put into place, particularly against anti-imperialist figures what's consistently underestimated is google seo and so when you google your name like a bunch of hit pieces come up one especially from texas monthly which is like this centrist publication based in austin um which isn't really texas and um it could have been written by like you know 53 grim bureaucrats in langley i mean it just basically it isn't even about you, but it calls you someone who's telling, you know, you're trolling for Putin. And it says you're just basically Putin's uh, telling Putin's side of the story. Um, did they, I don't know if they interviewed you for that, but what, what's your response to this? Uh, Actually, this in is, fact, yeah. they, in fact, they came, uh, uh, what was her name? Sonia Smith uh, came to Donetsk with a uh, photographer from Kiev and spent about a week here. Uh, to do that interview, um, Sonia Smith uh, went to uh, Brown University. She uh, speaks Russian. And um, I mean, she came here to do a hit piece. But if you read that whole article, I think she ended up writing it a lot less critical than she intended to when she first came here after she saw what the real deal was. And I think that her editors, uh, you know, forced her to put stuff in, you know, I mean, because she's saying stuff like what I was saying, you know, while it was actually technically true, was that, uh, you know, but it, it uh, matched up perfectly with the, the Kremlin line or whatever, you know, 
Well, I, but really hey, quickly, man. sorry to cut you off, Russell, but I love this propaganda point because it's often used against us and our website, The Gray Zone. Uh, these websites, uh, when they attack us, they, they will do the same thing. I mean, they will never even engage with the actual content, and, and they'll say, well, it might technically be true, but it's exactly what the Chinese government is saying and the Russian government is saying. So, and we can't prove that you're linked in any way, but but you're clearly just helping Chinese and Russian disinformation. I mean, it's so funny. Sure, okay, it's true, but you shouldn't say it because Putin says it too. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, if, if, if it's true, then it isn't really propaganda. It's just the truth. You know, I mean, and you can you can use the truth for different purposes, but if it's true, then it's true. Yeah, I mean, that's just uh, it's one of the kind of the things that makes me sometimes fantasize about leaving this culture behind and just going to somewhere far, far away. Because sometimes when you say something that's so obviously true on social media or in public, you have to be attacked by a mob in order to convince people that it's false and no one ever disproves it. I mean, we've just had so many hit pieces come out about the gray zone and at no point do any of them dispute anything we're saying. They just try to dissuade you from reading us by, you know, just, just pouring slime all over us. So, I mean, I see the same techniques used against you and it was partly why I wanted to have you on. Um, but, you know, just pivoting slightly back to the Donbass and your decision to go there, um, you know, you are attacked harshly for going there, but there are other foreign fighters in our society and in, in mainstream U.S. society who are celebrated, and they're the ones who go to Rojava, um, and they participate in this, you know, bottom-up, grassroots, autonomous struggle that actually happens to be bootstrapped by the U.S. military. There are four. There are several military bases inside what is actually the northeastern semi-autonomous Kurdish-occupied area of what is really Syria. They're selling Syrian oil out from under the ground uh, to starve the Syrian state of revenue to U.S. corporations, or they're like just. Uh, siphoning, siphoning it off and smuggling it across the Turkish border. Um, they're occupying wheat fields. And so many Americans have gone there as anarchists, as anti-fascists to fight ISIS and come back. And they have films made about them. Two of the founders of Jacobin are making a film about a, a quote unquote gender fluid fighter who went to, to um, help the Kurds. But how? I mean, why do you think it is I mean, I kind of probably made it too obvious where I was coming from, but why do you think it is that these fighters are celebrated, whereas so few American self-identified anti-fascists go to the Donbass to fight a force that is explicitly, proudly, overtly ultra-nationalist, if not neo-Nazi, and carries the legacy of working and collaborating directly with Nazi Germany in World War II. Why, why, do, why is that? Well, I mean, first of all, because these guys uh, that are joining the, uh, the Kurds, you know, they're useful idiots. You know, I mean, they're basically uh, joining, you know, the fight against uh, Bashar al-Assad, which is a uh, objective of U.S. imperialism. So, of course, you know, I mean, it's like all the movies uh, they made about the the soldiers in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff as being heroes for invading uh, an innocent country, you know, that we had no business being there or the U.S. had no business being there. And as far as the uh, lack of other uh, Americans, um, I know of two that came here to fight besides myself. Uh, one was uh, had the hall si call sign of Hunter. He was here in uh, early 2014. Uh, he joined Vostok Battalion 2. I never met him. He was only here for a couple of months. Um, and, you know, he never identified himself or anything. The other guy that came here was born in Russia. 
and uh, moved to the United States um, in about the year 2000 and uh, had lived in Austin, Texas. And uh, I met him. We both ended up in Donetsk on the same day in the uh, uh, recruitment office of Vostok. And he fought here uh, in the Supremini unit with me uh, very well and bravely for several years. He was wounded real hard, and uh, now he he lives in Russia. But there have been very few Americans that have come here. Uh, There's been quite a number of Spaniards and uh, Italians that have been here, Uh, some real good friends of mine, real great uh, fighters. Uh, a lot of Serbs have been here. A lot of Russians came, of course, Belarusians. Uh, my best friend at the front was from Belarusia. But the reason that not more Americans have come here is because, you know, the left in America is a gender fluid joke. You know, I mean, those guys, uh, you know, in some cases literally have no balls. You know, they're not going to come here. They're not willing to, you know, get cold and dirty and hungry, much less do hard work or get shot at or killed or wounded, you know? I mean, the posers of the American left, man. I mean, I remember back, must have been about 2004 or something in Seattle. And this is actually when I was escaped from prison. I did five years in federal pen for weed and escaped halfway through for eight years. But uh, I used to go to these uh, uh immigrant rights marches on the 1st of May. And um, I was there and I heard that the uh, ISO, International Socialist Organization, that they were doing more work on the Green Party candidate campaign than the Green Party was. And I said, oh, well, these that's my kind of guys. So I started going to their meetings and stuff. They were making their shirts with said revolution, you know, with like a torch and an exclamation point. And they were like, well, what can we do to bring about revolution? And at this time, you know, I was escaped from prison. I was a lumberjack. I was working off the books, getting paid cash. And I said, well, you know, the first thing you got to do is quit paying taxes. Because if you pay taxes, then, you know, you're financing your enemies. And they use every dollar against you. And this dude, the young firebrand, he says, oh, but if, if we don't pay our taxes, we might get in trouble. I mean, and he says this with with revolution written on his shirt, you know. So, you know, they didn't come here because it might have been uh, inconvenient or they might not have had a place to charge their iPhone. Well, I, I, I can't I, I just never participated in any of those parties. But the ISO in particular, I mean, we've talked about them on this on our podcast before. I mean, we call them the International PSYOP or International Suburban Organization. I mean, they're particularly a joke. And of course, they disbanded so they could burrow from within like little neocons inside the DSA International Committee. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, it's pre- it's a pretty sad state here. And well, I don't know. I, actually, you, I just want to share. And, well, I was just going to I was just going to toss to Ben. I mean, Ben's yeah. in, in Managua. And I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been <laughs> living in, in Nicaragua where there also is an, an actual left that has power and you know there's a lot of difficulties and compromises but they're still moving forward and advancing and it's just so funny really quickly i don't want to spend too much time on this but just while we're sharing stories about the iso when i was younger and uh just out of college and impressionable i was i had moved to dc and i you know was a socialist and, and interested in lefty politics and i came across the iso as well and i was like oh cool they 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 sound like they our great organization. I didn't know anything about them. And then I slowly realized that, you know, that their indoctrination method is entirely, I mean, it might as well be a PSYOP, totally committed to creating this fake socialist left that that supports every single prerogative of U.S. imperialism. I remember when, I remember I used to go to a few meetings, just, I was never a member of ISO, but when I was younger and just getting involved, I remember they would, this was when Hugo Chavez was still alive. This was like around, right before he died. Maybe it was like 2013 or 2012. And I remember that they would always attack Hugo Chavez and say he wasn't a real socialist. 
And I started, I, I started being really confused. And then I remember talking with one of like the older ISO um, leaders, and he went on this long rant about how Ho Chi Minh was evil, and Ho Chi Minh was a horrible Stalinist who persecuted the twelve Trotskyites who there were, were in all of in all of Vietnam at the time, and and Ho Chi Minh was bad, and it should be neither Vietnam nor Washington should be the position. And I was just like, these people are absolute psychos who talk about useful idiots. And and of course, on Syria, we saw the exact same thing where they totally they provided a fake left cover for supporting imperialism. They did the same thing with Libya. So I think, I mean, you know, the point that you're making is absolutely right. This is something that we're really committed to exposing is that there has been this fake left constructed, especially in the United States and Western Europe, but it's also been exported through NGOs, through big billionaire funded foundations, through liberal media outlets, this fake left that talks about socialism, although they, they often use the term democratic socialism to be like, well, we're not like, you know, the socialists in Cuba we're in Nicaragua. We're like Scandinavia, which, of course, these Scandinavia, many of these countries in Scandinavia are involved with NATO. Um, Norway helped support the NATO war in Libya. Also, these countries themselves are deeply embedded in, in imperialism. So it's it's I mean, it, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and for me, coming to that realization and realizing that the, the the main dividing factor in the US left is not some question about like socialism in one country and permanent revolution and, and the Sino-Soviet split and all these. I mean, these are important historical debates, but the real the real debate in, in my view, the real dividing line is between socialists who are anti-imperialists and everyone else who are just LARPers and, and fake posers at that point. Exactly. And, and I guess, I mean, I mean, I guess of, imper anti-imperialism is one of the motivations that brought you to... Wait, wait, wait. I want to ask, how did you break out of jail? Uh, well, okay, I got five years for uh, weed possession. And uh, because I was nonviolent, because it was my first offense in five years, is actually considered a short sentence in the Fed if you don't snitch. And I didn't snitch. I was the only one on my case that didn't. <clears throat> but uh, they put me in a minimum security prison. I was at first I was in a medium security, uh, Wasika, Minnesota, which actually was a uh, college, the uh, U of M agricultural satellite campus that was shut down because it had asbestos, and the Bureau of Prisons bought it and turned it into a prison. Eventually, I got my uh, uh, security level lowered to minimum, and then they shipped me to another college in South Dakota, Yankton, South Dakota, that was also a former college that was turned into a prison. But I mean, so you know, it wasn't like I had to uh, you know dig a tunnel or anything like that. It was you know pretty much cut through a screen and jump a fence that didn't even have barbed wire. You know, the hard part was you know not getting out but staying out. And I did stay out for uh, 2,848 days before I got snitched out uh, again and then had to uh, return and finish up my sentence. I was very, very lucky. I'm have to say uh, uh, guardian angels were looking out because when the U.S. Marshals got me, they took me to a maximum security prison in SeaTac near Seattle, and they put me there. And by raising my prison level from formerly minimum to maximum, that's actually considered a sanction or a punishment. And what they would usually do is keep me in the county jail, fly me back to Minneapolis where I had my original case, give me uh, more time for escaping, and then raise my level. But because they put me in a maximum security under the double indemnity, they couldn't give me any more time. So I was, I mean, like, I've been the, like the luckiest guy I ever heard of, you know. But uh, I end, just had it, ended up uh, finishing the rest of my bid about a year and a half uh, in a maximum security prison, which, you know, is no joke. But uh, I ended up, 
I had some of the best times of my life during that eight years. Mostly lived out in uh, uh, Northwest Washington. Uh, spent about a year south of Chicago and a year in Tulsa. Had some good times, man. Uh, you know, and it was one of the things that I always wanted to do <laughs> was escape from prison. And I did, you know, I mean, if, if you had asked me when I was 13 years old, you know, what I really wanted to be, it wasn't a fireman or an astronaut or a millionaire. It was a revolutionary soldier fighting against fascism. And I'm 60 Which years old now. And that's what I'm doing, man. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the happiest I ever been in my life, man. My wife is so cool. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. She's 20 years younger than me. She takes care of me. You know, I mean, you know, I got a small house with a big garden. You know, I mean, it's, it ain't easy, but it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, you know, I wake up every morning. I can't believe how wonderful it is. What does your uh, family back home think of what you're doing? Well, my mom died before I came here, a couple of years before I came here. Uh, my brother was a huge supporter, uh, and he died of a heart attack uh, in October 2015, uh, a little less than a year after I got here. You know, my dad is a, uh, you know, hardcore uh, George Bush Republican. You know, my sister's, uh, you know, a uh, hardcore uh, Clinton Democrat, you know. So, you know, my sister and dad don't support me at all. You know, they have been visited by the FBI and, you know, kind of intimidated. My sister still writes me, you know, one paragraph letters every once in a while. You know, I'm, you know, I don't speak with my dad anymore. Um, a lot of my friends that have supported me, you know, and still do, you know, more than a few of my friends have gotten FBI and IRS visits, you know, what, is it, what, what, is, what does the FBI say when they visit your family or friends? Well, I don't know exactly. They just, uh, you know, ask why, why they're, why my friends are in contact with me. Uh, you know, they ask if they know what I'm doing. Um, you know, and they say, well, you know, maybe, you know, he could be involved in terrorism or something, you know, which, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going back to the United States uh, unless I'm, you know, driving a tank to liberate it, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the death list of the uh, Ukrainian army for sure. Uh, $60,000 price on my head. And that's been since 2015. And, uh, you know, I have to be careful, but I'm, I'm going to do, you know, when I, like I said, when I came here, I didn't expect to live through the winter. It's been seven years. It's all gravy. You know, I never expected to live to be 60 from when I was a teenager, you know, and yet here I am, you know, so I'm just going to keep doing what I think is right. You know, I'm going to keep helping the good people and fighting against the bad people. You know, uh, the, the, the government here and the army here has seen fit to let me have a pistol and let me have a Kalashnikov, you know. So if, if these guys want to come mess with me at home, you know, we'll see how it ends up. They might kill me, but they're not going to catch me. You know, so, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to do what I think is right, you know, and, and so far it's, it's worked out better than I could have ever imagined. Well, right on. Right yeah, on. Well, I mean, I think that's a good place to wrap up unless you want to ask anything else, Ben. Yeah, Russell, I, just to conclude here, I was just going to ask what your thoughts are on where this is all headed. I mean, do you really think that the U.S. slash NATO slash EU, which is all basically the same kind of Washington-led imperial bloc, do you think that they really are going to try to have a conventional war with Russia because I mean we've seen since the overthrow of the Soviet Union uh, we since NATO lied to Gorbachev about not expanding east it's continued expanding eastward the color revolutions overthrowing every um, you know Soviet uh, 
al former Soviet Russia allied government and installing a NATO puppet regime and of course Ukraine and Belarus with they, they're trying in Belarus and they succeeded in Ukraine and then we've seen this recent military buildup what, what is the end goal what do you think they actually want to actually do is is it war with Russia is it balkanization of Russia dividing it up so it can never rise again well I mean to be honest I sincerely believe that you know this is like you know the genuine war between good and evil you know I believe in God and I I truly believe that the forces that control the United States you know are like literally and genuinely satanic and the one thing that is keeping them from being able to completely rule the world is Russia. And I think, I mean, they don't want a war with Russia, especially now with the modernization of the Russian military. They can't win. They cannot win a war against Russia. But I think what they're going to continue to do is use uh, proxy uh, soldiers, as in Syria, as in here in Ukraine, to, uh, you know, like be the, the hyenas, you know, biting at the feet of the lion. And I mean, I think that they're, you know, they're afraid to go to war. They, they cannot win a war against Russia, and they know that. Um, so well, they're going to... Well, and especially, it, Russell, what about the role of China? I mean, we've seen that Russia and China have increasingly become allies, and I mean, if, if there were a, an actual conventional war, it would very likely draw China in. Oh, that's I agree with that. I agree with that completely. And uh, the reason that I say that Russia is the thing that's stopping them is because if it weren't for Russia's, uh, you know, working together with China, their uh, strategic uh, cooperation, I think China could be... Um, they couldn't do a color revolution in China, but they could isolate China. You know, they could uh, pretty much turn the rest of the world against China. So, I mean, but Russia and China together are undefeatable and they are together now. And they understand that they <clears throat> need each other. I think that the uh, intention of uh, the enemies of Russia will be to continue to attempt uh, color revolution. There are a lot of pro-Western traders in very powerful positions in Russia, and it's a very dangerous situation there, uh, even to this day. And it's, I mean, it is by the grace of God that uh, Vladimir Putin, one of the greatest uh, patriots and statesmen in human history, is at the helm right now. And, you know, I certainly support the idea of him being president for as long as he can certainly handle it, because that's exactly what Russia needs. And uh, I think they'll continue. I mean, I've been in Moscow when I've seen these, you know, Navalny protesters come through, maybe 100, 200 people, you know, and they're just kind of mumbling and carrying signs, looking at the ground. <clears throat> they're, they're ashamed of what they're doing, but they're getting paid to do it. And they think they might get a an iPhone or a, I don't know, a, Ferrari or something out of the deal in the end, but you know, Russia is is strong, but it's still in a precarious place. Uh, the real danger there is is from uh, uh, internal enemies. I think at this point, rather than militarily. Well, thank thanks a lot for sharing your views with us, Russell. Um, we'll be we'll be following you. Where can I, I guess you're still on YouTube? They haven't taken you so off. Far. <clears throat> Interestingly, where, where? I did read today that uh, <clears throat> Putin is perhaps threatening to uh, ban YouTube from Russia because of YouTube's banning of uh, Russian media sites. It's, I mean, it's not absolutely confirmed yet, but that's uh, like some scuttlebutt that I heard today. Yeah. So he hopefully, slowed, they slowed the Kremlin slowed Twitter down, didn't they, for a period? Well, it's, I mean, information war is also real war, man. And it's as important, sometimes as difficult, and every once in a while can be as dangerous, you know. So it's just another aspect, you know, it's 
in the end, it's going to be them or us. And uh, so we just got to keep fighting. We got to work together with the real people like you guys are doing. Expose the posers, you know, call bullshit when you see it. You know, that's 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 a crucial, a crucial part of our job as information warriors is to, you know, uh, criticize ourselves and our so-called comrades, you know, and we got to be able to take it as much as we dish it out. But, you know, the truth is our most powerful weapon. Yeah, well, and and speaking of social media censorship, I think we've we've seen kind of a growing kind of new digital iron curtain, right, where anything that challenges U.S. NATO propaganda is censored. So Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram are all kind of have they've all become the U.S. NATO Western uh, social media. And I know you are you are banned on those, but you're active on VK. So I guess people can find you there at VK. I know China VK, has social media too, but it's impossible. I VK can't and YouTube uh, <laughs> at the moment. I am. I have some computer issues that I'm trying to straighten out, and as soon as I do, I'll be uh, getting on Telegram. I think that's going to be a real platform of the future. Yeah, we're on there as well. If anyone cool. uh, wants to follow the gray zone, um, and definitely agree. Uh, but you know, who's to say? that the same kind of NATO oriented apparatus hasn't already gotten its teeth into telegram. I mean, I think that's coming as well. So I think the future is blockchain technology, blockchain. So oriented social media where there is really no middleman, there's no Amazon server that can be pulled out. Um, and I've actually been looking into it for ourselves, but that's sort of low on my priority list because I have to like edit five pieces today. So, I mean, I can, I barely have time to do my own taxes. Yeah. Russell, I paid, I'm paying taxes. I mean, I'm here in Washington, DC. I'm like a world away from where you're at. I'm just trying to keep the gray zone going to give people, uh, di you know, different way of understanding the world. We're just educating people with straight up shoe leather and investigative journalism. I see you're doing a different thing, but you really, I mean, you know, props to you for keeping it real. Uh, you, you know, you give it raw, you know, no OJ, no straw. And, and you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your views. And, you know, if uh, things break out and you're on the front lines with your Kalashnikov, we're going to have you back on if possible. So thanks right. a lot. <clears throat> I'm really, really appreciative of uh, you guys having me on. Um, I'm glad to be on anywhere I can. This is one of the best sites that I've been on in a long time. Uh, I'm proud to be associated with you guys and uh, contact me anytime. And uh, right don't worry about paying taxes, bro. Just uh, do what you can under the table. And uh, <laughs> I'm doing what I mean, can. We're, we're on the yeah. same side and I'm proud to uh, call you guys comrades. Right on. Great, Russell. Well, I, for people watching or listening, I'm going to post a link to Russell's YouTube channel in the comments below, in the description rather below. So definitely check out his channel until, I mean, hopefully they don't censorship, censor it, but um, he's got some excellent videos. And for anyone who wants to check out our other episodes or support us, you can go to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Dabei.